Welcome to the podcast. I am Shane Barker, your host of Shane Barker's Marketing Madness Podcast. In this episode, we'll be talking with my guest, Shay Robottom. She is the CEO of Shay Robottom Marketing. She helps founders executive grow their presence and generate revenue through LinkedIn by turning them into LinkedIn video creators. In the past, she was a CEO of Margle, where she used to help publishers create viral videos for Facebook. In the past, she was also a professional musician. Listen as she talks about how she dealt with her childhood wounds to become a successful marketer. Shay, how are you doing? Good. Thanks for being so patient with me, man. I had like an influx of podcasts over the summer. It totally burnt me out. I was like, I'm fucking over this podcast bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's what we're talking about. So that's a good way to start the podcast. You're like, I'm so tired of these podcasts. And I really, you know, like I try to be pragmatic and it's like, yeah, you know, I really haven't had a lot of success with like getting leads through podcasts. Like I've mm. gotten like new followers and stuff. I really like appreciate like the micro content that I sometimes get from podcasts. Some of those yeah. have done really well for me. And then I get to promote the podcast a little on my page too, which is like a win-win but yeah, no, it's like just crazy, man. I try all these other channels. I do all this other stuff and it always comes back to LinkedIn. Like I just, I get way more leads through my LinkedIn videos than anything. So I'm trying, basically now I'm moving into a place of establishing myself in other channels because you can't just be dependent on one. Yeah. But yeah, no, that's like really what it's been for me. It's just like LinkedIn videos and like, I'll go do a speech, I'll go do this. And it's like the videos, like the videos like always get me the most return. So yeah, this podcast thing, I was kind of like taking a back seat for a while, but I had my break. I'm good. I'm ready to go. Let's do this. Right. Yeah. Let me know. I love it. I love it. It's funny how we talk about a podcast because it's, it is, I mean, I've done a lot of podcasts as well. And it's like, I don't know if I can really say that it's brought me tons of business, right? It's like one of the things it's mm-hmm. exposure and for thought leadership and there's some value to it, I guess. But I can't right. say that, oh, I closed this big client. Actually, there was one podcast that brought me like yeah. two or three great leads. Like, I don't know what it was. It was like a crazy entrepreneur. They, what they did is they sell businesses. And so the business owners listen to it and they want to sell their business in 10 years and how to do that. It was some influencer marketing thing that I was doing. And once again, it, and so we got a great, great amount of leads from that. But for right. the most part, even though we're going to be doing podcasts heavy in 2020 and just doing more of my podcast because we've only we started this in July and have oh. some good traction with Apple and some you know whatever nice. note yeah, newsworthy and some other fun stuff yeah yeah so it's cool it's cool awesome are you where you at now you in what Miami I live in Miami yeah mm-hmm. so did you just move or what I'm, I'm tr- trying to I was trying to stalk you a little bit before you jumped on yeah I'm from Milwaukee born and raised so I had uh, my first business that I ended up just scaling in Milwaukee I got an investment at 24 and I just kind of naturally got built in my hometown. I'm not really a cold weather person. Like I always thought I'd leave the Midwest way sooner, but I got tied up there. You know, I started like my company. I had all these employees. So it was just my life. And then um, about a year ago, you know, I got into it with my investors. You know, I was like starting to feel pretty unfulfilled. We weren't getting along. They didn't like me like at all, even though I ran that <laughs> shit. That's what they didn't like. They didn't, they didn't like me. Yeah. They fucking like didn't like me. Like it was straight sexism. Like they didn't even like try to hide it. Like they were just really threatened by me, like old conservative men. Because then when I left, I was like, okay, fine. Like they wanted to like demote me basically. And I don't tell a lot of people this, but like basically they wanted to demote me. And I'm like, you're gonna demote me. Like, okay, I'm leaving. Like, I'm not being yeah. demoted. I founded yeah. this. Like, that is so disrespectful. Like, no. So I said, buy me out, buy me out. And they did. They bought me out. They had like a hella crazy non compete. I'm like, oh, I'm not valuable, but you got, you're all threatened by me leaving and doing, you know what I mean? It was just like clearly, like, they did find me very valuable. They were just like, they just don't like powerful women. And this is not just my investors. This is like my last business partner. I mean, I done attracted all sorts of awful narcissistic businessmen in my life because of my childhood and where I come from. And we can get into all of that, but it's like really when I finally put my foot down and started standing up for myself, started healing, that's when things really opened up for me. So I moved to Miami. I took my payout. I left, I packed everything up. I moved down here in March, man. And it's just been like one growth journey after the next. Like, I mean, I have grown a lot in business the past year, but it's like really not even that. Like I've like gone through a whole bunch of personal growth down here, met a lot of healers down here. There's a great like spiritual community down here. I I wasn't expecting that. I thought I moved to Miami for business, fucking tax laws, you know, all that shit. And like, yeah, dude, I just ended up doing a bunch of work on myself. My partner and I actually just broke up three months ago. So that was huge. Like I've been with him for four years. He was my business partner. So now I'm a solopreneur, like literally, like, like it's just me. I've been like slowly shedding people for the past 
year or so. And now it's just me and I like it. So that's what's going on. Definitely comes from what we put out there. For sure. I was just like very unconscious of a lot of my insecurities. So through business, I started to learn like a lot about myself, which I'm super grateful for. And it's funny. So we call it Shane Barker's Marketing Madness podcast because we talk about a lot of different things. Marketing is one of those things, but I've had crazy guests talk about different crazy things, right? That are in their life. And I think this is cool that we're talking about, obviously you do a lot of viral stuff. We'll talk about LinkedIn and the different type of content you produce, but I do like to hear a little bit about your background as well, like where you grew up. So you you grew up in Milwaukee, right? So you were, and you lived there until just recently, you just moved a few months ago. Yep. Yep. I grew up in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Yeah. I never lived anywhere, but there I did live in Madison, Wisconsin for like two years, a little bit of a college thing. Didn't work out, but yeah, like I never moved away from my hometown until recently. And then you you have a pretty big family there still. Is your family live there? Yeah. I don't talk to my family. Gotcha. Yeah. A lot of them are, a lot of them are still up there. My intermediate family, like my sisters and stuff got out. Like we all moved away. I was actually one of the last ones to move away. They, they kind of dipped right at 18, most of them. So my sisters are scattered around the country. Don't really have much relationship with them. Do not talk to my parents, will not. And then like, yeah, all the like aunts and uncles, grandparents, those are like, a lot of them are still up in Milwaukee, yeah. I love it how you say they got out. It's like a prison sentence. You're like, no, they got out, they escaped. Like we just, thank God I was yeah. the last one. We just barely. I would say they got out a little bit. I still think there's a lot that they're not facing either. I've always been very rebellious to my family. I mean, very... Shot? You don't have that personality. Mm-hmm. That's a joke. Well, it's funny because people do, people do ask me sometimes, how are you so resilient? How do you handle, you know, obviously like anyone who grows a page like to the volume that I have gets a lot of hate, gets a lot of... Yeah. Uh, just, you know, the bigger you get, the more people, especially as a woman, you know, studies have shown the more successful a woman becomes, the less likable she is versus a man. It's the opposite. The more successful he becomes, the more likable he is. It's crazy. So like, yeah. So like, there's definitely haters, but because I come from a home where I was already rejected, like my family basically always hated and resented me anyways. It's just like made me so strong. Like even my, some of my friends are like, Oh my God, that comment. I'm so sorry. People are mean. I'm like, dude, you guys don't even realize this does not affect me like at all at all. I love the haters. Like, bring it on. What you got to say, you know, I just learned from it. Like, maybe there's a sliver of truth in what they're saying. Because a lot of times when we get offended, it's because it's true. Yeah. Strike to court. Yeah. You know, how are you not offended by all these comments? Well, because a lot of them don't land for me. You know, people saying things like, you're a flash in the pan entrepreneur, Shay, you're fake, you're this and that. I don't, none of that's true. So it doesn't land for me. You know, if it's something like your bitter Shay and your anger shines through your content, then it's kind of like, oh yeah, <laughs> that might be true. <laughs> so you got to like be objective, even with the haters, because you can learn something from them. Well, and that's the thing. I think social is so hard, especially when you start to make it. I mean, you know, I, I always tell people, clients and even people I work with, like, if you don't have people hating on, you haven't made it yet, right? I mean, especially in the social yes. scene, which is unfortunate, right? Because it's, you'd like to think that it's more supportive. And I think it is a lot harder, as you've uh, touched on with women, right? I mean, it's just, it's a, it's, mm-hmm. it's harder out there, right? Because yeah. especially if you look at, I mean, YouTube is just brutal. I just, yesterday I was looking at, I was, long story short, I was looking up some content and we're doing some video stuff and I was trying to find some old footage. And I was reading some of the comments of some of the other stuff. And I don't ever read the comments because I just don't because there's really, I don't yeah. find tons of value in it. And there was people saying, oh, you're this and you're that. And I thought, God, you guys just, I really think that if you guys use this time that you're on YouTube and went and volunteered or maybe got a puppy or something or done something a little more productive or maybe, you know, step in front of a car or something like that. Do something that I think would right. you know benefit everybody in the long run. But it is just pretty, a pretty negative, can be a negative scene out there. But I love the fact that you're kind of flipping that on its head and like, it doesn't land for me. Yeah. Which is cool. Not yeah, not only that, but I've turned a lot of haters into fans. I make video content about this. I'm going to actually repost that video soon. It had a headline that got flagged by LinkedIn, so it like didn't go anywhere. I got to repost it with a new headline. But anyways, I basically like I've many times reached out to haters, like even people who were just like um and I'm not talking about like constructive criticism. Like I'm talking yeah. about like people who are blatantly rude, like clearly yeah. like tr- trying to hurt Trolls. you. I've straight up reached out to them before and like been very kind and loving and said like, Hey, you know, I am legit. I am. I know I look young. Maybe you, you know, think that I'm just a blonde millennial, like playing popularity on LinkedIn. But like, I assure you, I do have a business. I am very serious about what I do. I do love to help business owners. Like if you've ever liked to learn more, here's my info, like much love, appreciate the feedback on my post. I always love reading the comments. Like they always turn into fans. Always. Yeah. I haven't, I mean, maybe a few have been like, no, fuck you. But 
honestly, like a lot of haters, people don't realize if you just approach them and you're like nice and you confront them directly, not in the comments, because you don't want to make it like in the message, yeah. I'll go direct message them. Yeah, dude, a lot of those people turn into fans and then they comment on like all my stuff and they love me. It's like hilarious. It's funny. You and I have some parallels and I've never talked about this on my podcast. I'm going to go heavy into this, but there was okay. a, a back in the day I was sued. I was sued by one of my companies. I had a big company, 130 employees. Sued. Wow. I mean, it was a crazy, crazy story. But what happens, I had a lot of people online saying stuff because they would see me in the media and some other stuff that was going on and they would write some bad stuff. And they would say all these crazy comments and I first would really take it to heart, right? And there was four yes. people that was going through a court case, which is, you can probably Google it and find it out. Well, nobody's ever heard this on my podcast and I've been doing this for a long time. Wow. So this is an interesting story. Oh, the secrets come out when Shay this, comes on, you guys. This is, I was like, do, I don't tell a lot do, of people do. this. I'm just like, uh -huh. you know, crying and I'm holding on my blanket. And I, <laughs> but I feel comfortable. So there we go. And here was the deal. I had about four or five people that were really blasting me online. I did the same thing. In fact, I told my attorney I was going to do it. He's like, do not do that. I reached out to him and said, hey, you guys are saying this and saying I'm a fraud. I'm this, all kinds of stuff. Like, let's meet for lunch. And they're like, if I meet you for lunch, I'm going to beat you up. I'm going to do this. Yeah, it sounds good. Awesome. Let's meet. Like, I'm, uh, I'm Irish. <laughs> I got a red beard. I'm pretty active. Like, I'm, you know, boxing classes. Like, I'll, I'll take the Pepsi right. challenge. You got a little well, Conor McGregor up in you I there. Yeah. I didn't want to bring it up, but I'm like, don't. Not today, Satan. Not today. <laughs> So, right. So that was the deal. And so I ended up meeting, the funny part was, is all four of them that I met with, three of them offered me a job at the end of the thing. And I said, this is what you guys see and what you think, you know, what's going on. Like, let me explain to you how this whole thing, you know, came about and what wow. you think, you know, and this, and by the end of it, and it was awesome. Not that I was looking to turn them into like advocates or, or sure, fans, yeah. but it was like, Hey, like you guys are, you're over here mouthing up, but you don't know the whole story. And you're just mouthing off because you feel like it's great to mouth off. And I'm here to tell you like, that's not the deal. And I'm, and if I was uh, whatever you think that I am, I, if I was a con artist or whatever you thought, I wouldn't be here talking to you, yeah. right? Like, why would I come and confront you? Like if I was, if I made millions of dollars and ran off to Mexico and, you know, grabbed strippers and cocaine and that was my deal, then why would I be here talking? Why would I even care what you yeah, had to say? Right. Exactly. Right. Other than the fact that you were saying some stuff that I wanted to, to call you on it. And so anyways, mm -hmm. it's interesting that you do that because I do the same thing. I never really told anybody that, but it was, you know, cause for me, it's like, listen, you think you know who I am and you think you know what I've been through, but you have no no idea. Yeah. Right. And so I think that's important. And I think that's awesome. And this is, this is why we call it Shane Berger's marketing madness podcast. Cause you know, it's like we're now we're talking about other stuff, but I think that's awesome. Like your journey, like you've been kind of built for this. You've been kind of built for haters to come at you. Like you're kind of, that's exactly what I said. I said, I was built for this and I faced so much rejection so early on in life, like tons. I used to be very sensitive about it. I used to run out of auditions crying. I mean, like I look back and I say, thank you to every single person who ever rejected me. Thank you because you all made me so strong and success is the best revenge. All those people who rejected me, even, you know, ex partners, investors, whatever, who didn't want to see my value. That's fine, dude, because I'm going to go on. I'm going to make it anyways. You're going to make me stronger and you're going to see what you missed out on. And that's what, pretty much where I'm at. I'm going to go get a shade tattoo today. I've decided yeah, I'm going to go at your name it. somewhere. Yeah. I mean, that's it. Today's the day. Getting it done, son. Wipe it up. Yes, I love it. <laughs> no, that's awesome. No, I love I love your attitude. I think that's very, it's very contagious because, you know, mm. the, the, obviously mm. you've been through a lot, right? And I think you're you're ready for this kind of stuff. And I, you know, obviously I've seen your content and, and I think it's awesome that you're, I think it's interesting. So I, I think it's interesting that you're using LinkedIn and you've kind of touched on that in the beginning, right? It's like, you would think that mm. with the content you produce is very much Instagram, very much kind of lifestyle and well, a little bit lifestyle, but funny. And yeah. but it's interesting how it has that LinkedIn side of it. Like kind of, how did that work? Like, when did you realize you're like, LinkedIn's kind of on fire right now? Like, when did you realize that was the, the place to the platform? Well, I got approached about LinkedIn about a year and a half ago through a friend who said he was having a lot of success on it. Like, hey, the organic reach is really great right now. I think you should make some original video content to get leads back for your my Facebook agency at the time. I'll admit, I didn't know anything about LinkedIn. Like I still kind of, didn't see it as a valuable platform, even as a businesswoman, like I was never using it. I think I hired like a lead gen service one time, but my profile was like idle. I wasn't doing content. So it was like a whack yeah. campaign, but, um, he said organic reach and I was like, okay, like I got to, I got to at least see because where I come from in the Facebook world, working with all these, all, all of my clients were like blog owners, very talented people, like very talented, like massive followings on Facebook. Some of the biggest pages on Facebook, they're my ex clients. And I noticed a theme very early on in working so closely with them that a lot of them built their page at the right time. And that's mm -hmm. why they were so established because it's very hard to grow on Facebook organically today. A lot of them got in at the gold rush, grew their page, established it, and they'll just 
they're kind of just set. They'll, they'll always be making money, even when the algorithm, eh, 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 it's like they're established. So I saw that happening on LinkedIn. I quickly realized like, oh my God, yeah, it might be too late for me to like grow on Facebook or even YouTube, even Instagram. Like I get that people might see me as a little more fit for those platforms, but it truly did have a lot to do with just growth. Like why invest in these other platforms when I can grow so quickly here, which mm. I did. And now the overflow is almost just naturally happening with the other platforms. Like I haven't had to do much promoting. People are starting to find me on other channels. I do plan to get a little more raw and Shay like on the other channels, you know, cause I, cause you're right. I do talk about a, a variety of topics outside of just business, but LinkedIn for me has definitely been the gold mine because yeah, even though I show up like I'm not solely about business and I'm my own personal brand. I talk about my struggles as a woman, as a human. It still gets amazing results. I mean, I've really built like a tribe of people who just trust me. They respect me for my authenticity. Uh, they're not deterred, you know, from doing business with me just because I'm not perfect. And that's like a big misconception people have on LinkedIn. Oh, I can't get too personal. I can't get too vulnerable. I'm going to turn off prospects. Yeah, you might. But like for me, it's definitely not anything. They weren't going to be a good fit anyways. Right. And that's the way I look at it. They're going to be a good fit, but I'm also drawing in just so many more people that that one person I turned off, there's 20 more people coming in. So people ask why LinkedIn? Well, first of all, I'm doing B2B right now. So that's really anyone's jam right now. I suggest you get on LinkedIn for any sort of B2B marketing, any sort of high ticket offer that you have. Like if you're running ads on Facebook or Instagram for your B2B and you're not doing organic on LinkedIn yet, you're messing up big time because the views here are cheap. Your audience is like literally free and it won't be that way forever. So I naturally got on, started making a lot more money, started being myself. And then I, you know, pivoted from the last agency left, opened my own agency solely about LinkedIn marketing to teach basically people to do what I did because I had such success early on. And I can't lie. It's been a really great spiritual journey for me. Like I love this platform. It's way more conscious than other social media platforms. Everyone's a little more intelligent, educated. Everyone has money or like re access to money. And a lot of my audience is male, which is also really weird. You know, I didn't grow up with a lot of men. I've just come from a very feminine household, lots of girlfriends, lots of, you know, I didn't have brothers. It's like, it's just weird to me that there's all these like men, businessmen, like yeah. great people. And they just like highly respect me and follow me. And, uh, I'm like, wow. Okay. <laughs> so here, here I am with it. this like male following. I'm like, this is so weird, but dudes get paid. Dudes get paid. So I, I don't mind. I do not mind accepting their money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Amen to that. So when you talk about, you're talking about, and I, I want to talk a little more about LinkedIn, but what I do want to talk about is you said you're going to get a little more raw on the other social profiles. Like you can't just say that statement and expect for me just to like skip over and be like, oh, that sounds awesome. Like what is raw? Like LinkedIn is, I think is you, but what do you mean raw? Like, what are you, what are you going to go after? Yeah. I mean, I know that that probably comes as a shock to people. They're like, oh my God, how can you get more raw than like what you're already doing? But you know, I really haven't opened up that much about my own personal story. I really haven't, um, I really been avoiding like uh, and I talked about this a lot rec more recently is like just a lot of my like childhood trauma that I didn't deal with earlier in life, like that I brought into business. I brought into entrepreneurship. I brought into my last agency. I mean, I was accountable too. I was frankly very toxic at times. I mean, I definitely had, had value and I knew how to, I was a digital marketer ninja, but yeah. it was like, you know, just things like struggling to take responsibility for things. Like I kept running up against this victim mentality at a certain point. Like if enough people are telling you like, dude, you got issues taking responsibility for things, you better wake up. You know, like it's not just one, two, three people saying that it's a lot of people saying that. So for me, it's like, like the digital marketing, I, I am truly very passionate about teaching people that I love that I have this unique experience with my, you know, last company being in video licensing. I got to learn a lot, but I'm really called to more personal development as of lately and talking more about why people are so insecure, you know, why we have like the root issues that we have in society today addiction, obesity, divorce, depression. I mean, like one in four women is on antidepressants. The suicide rate for men is like ridiculous. You know, it's just like, there's a lot of things that we collectively have just been in denial about. And we keep all playing our small role in upholding this facade. But really, I mean, what it is, is just like an ocean of like mainly fake people is what it is through no fault of their own. This is how most of us are raised. This is how we're programmed, you know, mm -hmm. go to school, go to college, get married, check the boxes, look normal on the outside and anything like too like vulnerable or just like very, very, very. I mean, that was our parents' generation, their parents' generation. 
millennials are kind of blowing the lid off all that. We're like, dude, we're sick. We're depressed. We don't want kids. Why would I want kids? Like, why am I, why would I repeat this anymore? And people say millennials don't want kids because it's too expensive. Millennials don't want kids because they don't know how to raise kids because they're starting to recognize that their parents didn't know shit for how to raise them. And all we're doing is raising generation after generation of people who don't love themselves. And it's like really hard for parents to face. You try calling a parent out on not being a good parent. Whoa. The defensiveness is so fierce because they know deep down that their parents wounded them and they have a really sensitive spot for not doing the same thing. But oftentimes they do. Oftentimes they like have a surfacey different quality than their dad. Like, oh, well, my dad never came to my soccer games and I go to all my son's soccer games. So like, I'm not, I'm a way better dad, but they're still doing the same underlying like conditional love at the end of the day. Day. So parents confuse qualities and like personality traits with being a better parent, but they're still deep down operating from the same conditional love, wanting their kid to get into college so that they look good, wanting their kid to get straight A's so that they look good. Not for the kid, it's for them, you know, and it's just normal. So I'm about to blow the lid off that. I mean, I don't have kids, but I've studied a lot about childhood development. And this comes from my own experience growing up with narcissistic parents who were also deeply wounded from their own childhoods and never addressed it before reproducing and having five of their own kids. So it's an epidemic. It's something that I feel is kind of invisible. Like a, it's almost like cancer everyone knows is an epidemic. Narcissistic parenting and this sort of cycle of abuse we keep penetrating through generations has been almost somewhat hidden until recently. I plan to be at the forefront of that industry that starts to blow the lid off of like, okay, why are we so sick and unhappy? Something needs to change because what we're doing right now is not suiting the human spirit. And I think enough people are starting to wake up to agree like, yeah, this needs to become a priority. And this is, I think this is more on a, this is more on a personal level that you want to kind of your, I'm going to say crusade because it sounds like, I mean, that's kind of awesome, right? So is that, but it's more on a personal level. How is that going to tie into your business or is there going to be, or is it, um, how do you see that tying into like the LinkedIn and the videos and all that kind yeah, of stuff? Is that- that, that's a great question. I have a great answer for you. I am working to automate and delegate my marketing division so that I, I don't have to be so hands-on in the LinkedIn training personally. You know, I do have a great team of uh, social media experts. Some of them, you know, worked with me for many years, so they get it. But the reality is, is this marketing expertise is something I can take anywhere. And especially during my time in South Florida, you know, doing all this personal work, meeting all, more and more healers down here, you know, naturopaths, breath work, practitioners, shamans, all these different people that I've met that have really, um, oh gosh, just impacted me so much for the better. I mean, I, I've had like new, new life coaches that I've hired and just so many of these people are part of the, I like to call it like there's a huge disproportion right now in society of broken, wounded, like unconscious people out in the world wreaking havoc who need healing versus the amount of people who actually understand and can help you heal. It's like there's way too many broken people and not enough healers. And I'm not talking about Western doctors. I'm not even talking about clinical therapists. Fuck that shit. You know, I did talk therapy for seven years. Let me tell you, I went and did ayahuasca for one weekend. I called my therapist. It was like, yo, I wasted like straight up. Like I wasted seven years of money on you going to talk therapy. I just worked with a shaman for one weekend. I was very open to it. You know, you have to go in your own time. It's, it's on you, yeah. of course. But like that experience just absolutely blew the lid off of everything I had thought in traditional therapy. So I started investing more and more in these alternative medicines. Come to find there's all these amazing people that have these great healing modalities. However, in this community, a lot of these conscious people, they're amazing. They're like totally woke and, and healing and just like amazing energy to, to be around. But they don't know business. A lot of them don't know how to market themselves. A lot of them are just like they have a shit for presence on social media. So I'm really being called to, uh, you know, once I'm able to really automate the LinkedIn side of things, um, move my marketing to actually be a little more niche in helping healers and helping people in the conscious community, people in the personal development space, you know, like think like Tony Robbins, Brene Brown type, like those are the sort of healers and thought leaders that I want to market in addition to what I'm building with LinkedIn and all the business owners there too. Awesome. So, I mean, you're really going to take the equation that you've learned, well, through being a digital marketer and through on LinkedIn, and you're going to take that to people that don't know how to market. I mean, which makes sense, right? I mean, it makes total sense when you're talking about healers and stuff like that. Cause I think that is the hard part. Like, I mean, what do you look up like shaman healers in Sacramento, well, right? Or, well, or it's like, yeah. I mean, think right? about, 
Think about like effectiveness of digital marketing in the modern age and the darkness that kind of comes with the internet. A lot of these healers, they don't even, they don't even like social media, you know, because there's, there is a darkness here that they are protecting their energy from that they're very reluctant to like, I mean, it would be very rare to find someone who's like a shaman or like a breathwork practitioner, a very spiritual healer that also is like, oh yeah, I'm totally social media savvy. I'm on it. Like logic, you know, it's just not. So bridging that gap and really helping to get these messages out there. I mean, these are the products I believe in the most. And while I love helping business owners in any B2B space, this is what the world needs. You know, this is what the world needs is healing. This is what I needed. I realized I I would have made way more money. I would have been a way better boss. I would have been way better for my clients. I would have shown up so much better, provided more value for them. Had I done this healing work much, much earlier, which our society doesn't really promote or make it easy to find access to. You kind of got to go hunt it down on your own. Um, So if anyone out there is like listening and you're like lost in your personal journey, trying to do work on yourself and you feel like you don't have a lot of support, your family's looking at you like a weirdo for trying to go within, like, dude, you're not alone. Just keep going. I know it feels lonely. Reach out to me if you'd like. I'll try to get back to you. Like it is worth it. Absolutely. It is worth it. You know, I have had to go through some dark times, but absolutely came out the other side with the intention I originally sought out, which is like growth, healing, and peace, inner peace that I previously just could not access. So that's awesome. So, I mean, this is, once again, this is why I love talking to people because you just never, you know, I mean, I look at the questions that I send over and I'm like, we're not even going to get into probably any of these questions. Oh my we're gosh, I know. I'm sorry. I'm like veering. We can no, totally get No, no, no. No, yeah. we don't. No, we don't, sister. <laughs> you, you can't make a right hand turn and then do a okay, U turn and go right. try to make a left turn. Like, well, this is the path we're going down. We're not looking to things. I, I think it's really interesting just because um, what you're doing is you're going to develop a business around something that's helped you personally, right? Which I think is valuable because you're saying, hey, listen, there's a bigger, there's a bigger problem here, right? I do agree with yes. you. I think there, there's a huge problem. Right. With just everything you talked about, depression, obesity, alcoholism, drug use. I mean, all that. Right. right? right. But I mean, how do you I think the hardest part is, is because we usually go with, let's say, Western medicine of like here, medicate, do this, do that. Hey, you just came back from the war. Take this, do this, you know, and it doesn't it's not really taking care of the problem. Right. We don't take right. care of the, the main problem, which is there's a lot more going on. Right. I mean, we, we have yeah. our things that have happened in our past that have made it to where we're at today, whether that's good or bad or whatever. Some people break because of that. Some people don't. I mean, there's just a lot of things that, that tie into that. And you're going to take what you've done video wise and doing viral videos and creating that type of content. And you're, you're going to, you're what's you're going to use some of those same tactics and, and put it in to be able to get the word out about people that need help. Sounds like that's yeah, kind of the goal, huh? Ab- absolutely. You know, I, I feel that it's, very much needed for me and all business owners to have some sort of higher purpose aligned with their work. Now, I'm not going to sit here and act like I was completely unfulfilled the past four years doing social media, but you know, I was very conscious of like, I was doing it as a, to build a skill. I was doing it to have that skill on my tool belt. Like I want to know media buying. I want to know video creation. I want to know how the newsfeed works. I did that as an investment, knowing that I could take that knowledge with me anywhere. Mm -hmm. But you're right in that, like, it's not the driving factor behind, like, you know, making Facebook videos, making pet videos, all the stuff I did. It was fun. It humbled me. I learned a ton. I would not be the Shea Robotum you see today on LinkedIn without all that experience. However, I didn't have like that real higher purpose behind my work. And I see that now. I see that. It's like, dude, these... 12, 13, 14 hour days that we sometimes incur as entrepreneurs are so much easier to get through when you have a higher purpose behind your work. And so that's what I'm excited about stepping into is not just the healing and what I believe this world needs most right now and helping to market these healers to society, but also that I care. You know, I I care a lot more about helping the world heal from their childhood wounds and all this unaddressed trauma so we can stop repeating it, stop the cycle of abuse in children. I mean, that at the end of the day is going to drive me way more than, you know, just getting like a SaaS business, a higher lead stream through their LinkedIn. (laughs) So how did you make that? I want to talk about your journey here because I think this is really Mm -hmm. interesting. Like when you talk about a higher purpose, because I'll I'll be honest, I feel like I would say in the last probably six months or a year, I thought, what is my purpose, right? I mean, I I do not to, I mean, I do this keynote speeches. I do this. I have a podcast. I have a successful blog. I have, you know, a big team. I have this, I have all that. But I do feel like at times that that my purpose isn't aligned with what I really should be doing, right? I feel like I want to touch more people, right? I feel like I want to do more things. I try to do that with podcasts so people can learn and educate. But I do feel like there's, there is something missing. Like if I was to say, hey, I want to, something that's a little more fulfilling, right? Like I'm, you're always kind of looking for it. Like I do feel like I've talked about just recently about 
going and buying, I have an RV and what I was going to do is take that RV and go for like six months or a year and oh, just man. go on a journey and like, just go nuts. About to do some breaking bad stuff. I mean, ma- maybe RV, some, man. <laughs> I, I haven't done a lot of meth, but I, I mean, just, I mean, uh, yeah. love little bit when I was in college, just kidding. I've never done meth, but, <laughs> the, yeah. <laughs> but I think there's something about that. Like that journey of like, what are you going to, what are you going to find out there? Right. Cause I think you don't oh, yeah. know what you don't know. Right. And it's like, you kind of broken out of things that were happening in your past and you're, you're working on healing yourself for that. And I just think about it. I don't, you know, I don't know if there's tons of stuff that I necessarily childhood wise, maybe there was, I, I don't know that I can think of, yeah. but I'm just trying to think of like, what is it? How do you realize you're like, Oh, I mean, you said, yeah, you had all kinds of people who were saying, Hey, you're not addressing these certain things. You're like, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then all of a sudden you realize like, how do you make that transition? And then like go into finding healers and stuff like that. Cause it's not like you just go and you're like, you know, you go down to the mall and you're like, I'm looking for a healer. Like, Oh, it's, you know, right, three rows down. Right. You know, there's a healer. His name's John. He's really nice. And you know, I go, Oh, Hey John, yeah. what's up? Like how, no, what's that journey like? Yeah. That's like a really great question because I personally feel that I like had to hit rock bottom in a lot of ways. Rock bottom for me. I mean, it's different for everyone, but like for me, rock bottom was actually getting that payout that I got last year when I sold my shares in my old agency moving to Miami, like I always wanted, having more freedom, autonomy, independence, like I always wanted more money in the bank than ever before any 26 year old, probably, you know, it's like, I had it, I made it, I did it. Why am I still unhappy? You know, that was like the turning point for me. It's like the cliche saying like money doesn't buy you happiness. No fucking shit, man. I arrived in Miami with my, like, and I I was just like, I was coming on against all the same roadblocks. I was having trouble taking responsibility for things. I felt overworked and underappreciated. I felt like I just wasn't motivated. So that was my breaking point was like, okay, I have everything that I thought would make me happy. I'm still not happy. What's up? And that's when I really started to look back at my childhood. I started doing a lot of therapy to bring up like repressed memories because a lot of us will repress the true cause of our insecurity, which stems from childhood. But I also want to urge the audience to not feel like you have to hit a breaking point. I mean, I actually feel like that in itself is a limiting belief. Oh, I have to hit rock bottom. And, you know, maybe for you, it's like, I have to lose all my money and my girlfriend and blah to finally like face it. Like, no, you don't. <laughs> like you can start now. You know, that is also a limiting belief, feeling like you have to hit rock bottom and have this like heroic triumphal story. Like you can start now. But the truth is that a lot of people have been so programmed to like people please and want to be liked that beginning to face their own shame and their own shortcomings in any way. I mean, it's just like a deal breaker for a lot of people, not necessarily entrepreneurs, you know, business owners that have any sort of success have usually got to have some level of self-awareness or they are just purely operating from a place of narcissism, in which case they'll in an opposite way through an opposite route also find business success because they lack empathy and they can really trample over people. So for me, I do think having the business partners and like the old colleagues I used to work with helped because I worked with them so frequently on a day-to-day basis that I was able to get that feedback from them, which I really took seriously, especially when I kept hearing the same things like the victim mentality thing for like, that was huge for me to get past to start like owning my shit, taking responsibility, but it's not easy. It's certainly not easy. I certainly avoided it for a long time. Like I said, I I had to hit rock bottom. Um, I was stubborn. It's mainly about self-love, you know, self-forgiveness, like face yourself, face your shit. It's okay. It's okay. If you've been even the toxic person, even the hurtful person, like if you can look at it, face it, correct it. Like that is what, what we need so much in society, but people run away from their own. People don't own up to their own part in it, which is what's been really hard is all of these people, most of them wounded in childhood, never got addressed. They, they were truly victimized and it never got resolved. And they carry that with them. They're kind of bitter. They're kind of like, dude, fuck everyone. Like what the hell? Why, why am I so, you know, coming basically showing up in the world from a place of like, everyone's out to get me or the world's not a safe place. Of course, you're not going to want to take responsibility for things. Of course, you're going to play the blame game. Of course, you're going to, oh, it's Trump, you know, whatever people want to blame. There's a million things people want to blame. Blame yourself. Start taking a good hard look at yourself. How are you accountable? Oh, I was just in an abusive relationship with a guy for four years. Tough shit. How are you accountable? What are you doing to put yourself in that situation? How, How little respect do you have for yourself to stay day after day, even when you're getting red flags, knowing this person is toxic. You need to face your own insecurities, baby, because that's the only way you're going to get out. No one can save you but you. But how do you do that? So I get that. And I, I appreciate all that, right? Like, right. Like, I mean, it comes, how right. Do you do it? I'm like, I mean, and there's no like, you know, Hey Shane, follow these three things. And then you're going to be, you know, to the land of bliss and everything's yeah. going to be perfect. Like, 
how do you because the thing is i think most people traditionally go like hey i'm gonna go talk to a counselor okay that's great right um, and that's you can i recommend life coaches more than more than um uh clinically trained counselors life coaches usually do it because of their own passion and their own experience they're usually self-taught i find that self-taught people are way more effective than traditionally trained in the therapy space that's my experience so a life coach um, that's great. But really I would go to your friends. You know, if you think, think about like the relationships in your life right now, think about the ones that are actually maybe, I don't want to say the hardest, but the most triggering for you. You know, I have girlfriends that I love, I love to death, but I'll even avoid hanging out with them sometimes for how blunt and direct they are with their feedback for me. These are the friends you want. The people who are going to call you out on your bullshit, who are going to be the most direct. That's what love is. You know, love is not never telling your friend that you believe they have a real problem that needs addressing because, oh, I don't want to hurt their feelings or my friend. That is not love. You know, love for your friends and for the relationships in your life is telling them raw and honest feedback, even if it's going to hurt them initially. So I would say a more tangible tip for starting to break down your own programming, your own limiting beliefs that have been holding you back, like a lot of us have, is to think about which friends you trust and which friends you believe would be the most honest with you should you ask them this question. And simply go to them and say like, look, I know that we're friends. We like to be nice to each other, lift each other up a lot. But like, I'm really looking to improve my shortcomings. I'm really looking to address my flaws. And I'm aware that I might have a blind spot for my own flaws, my own shortcomings, my own toxicity, frankly. What do you think, honestly, I could work on? Can you give me some feedback? Do you feel that I'm defensive when people disagree with me? Do you feel like I'm conceited and cold and I don't let other people in? You know, whatever the case may be, Find a friend that you trust who you really believe is willing to be raw and honest with you and start to cultivate that relationship where you actually give each other feedback. Because I know for me, when I started having friends that didn't just people please me and actually called me out on my bullshit, uh, that's when things started to, to change a lot. I don't have any friends. So what happens if you don't have any friends? I mean, now, so do Mm. I just talk to myself or I mean, is it like, Hey Shane, I think you're should do this differently because sometimes you do this and I'm like, no, you don't Shane. I don't do that. You don't have any friends. Leave me alone. Well, I would start with making some friends, buddy. Come on. Okay. Come on. All right. You're, That's going to be my goal. That's going to be my goal. Do you know Mark Gaysford on LinkedIn? He's a recruiter. He's a creator. He's a friend of mine. He just huh. did a video on LinkedIn. It went viral. It was about how many men don't have friends. It's like a real epidemic. Like a lot of men, especially in the business sector, because they'll pour themselves into their work instead. A lot of men are very lonely. I mean, I know we talk a lot about male privilege. There's a real female privilege that doesn't get talked about enough that is women are definitely more privileged that we're taught to cry. You know, we're taught growing up, it's okay to be emotional. That's kind of like a thing that we've accepted with the female identity in in society, but we've like completely destroyed it for men. Like, dude, being masculine is not, not having emotions. Like people say there's a toxic masculinity epidemic. Screw that. There's a lack of masculinity ep- epidemic. I mean, these men are hurting. And I'm, I love that you just came out and admitted it. Like, dude, I don't have friends. Like, you're so not alone. I think it's really hard for a lot of men to open up, to feel safe, you know. So for you, I would definitely work on finding some friends. You know, get out more. It's funny. So I, I mean, I do, I do have friends, but I mean, the thing is, is I don't, it's funny. Cause I mean, this is just something that I've thought about recently. And what's going like, it's, I do have friends, right? I do have people, but I, I, I don't know. It's this weird thing of like, you would think of for whatever of the reasons that I would have all kinds of people and tons of people, but I'm uh, to hang out with, but I just don't. It's kind of like one of those things where like, you know, a ton of people, but you personally don't have like a, a tight, I, I can relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's like, I'm, I do a lot of, I don't know. It's like, I'll give you an example. Like people say, what is your hobby? And I'm like, I don't have an answer for that. Like, I mean, I work out, I used to do boxing and I do all, you know, this, all this fun stuff, but I don't really have anything that I'm like, oh, this is my hobby. Like we went to a shooting range just recently because I, I told us, I got my little list of things that I want to do, but it's just, it's interesting. I don't really have anything that I'm like, I mean, other than working, well, I used to be a terrible work all. Like I used to work 18 yeah. hours a day, 20 hours a day. Oh, I don't wow. do that anymore. Okay. Yeah, I was, I have the yeah, sickness. But you know, yeah. now I've got a full team and all this kind of stuff. So I'm able to delegate and stuff, but I'm, I don't know. It's just an interesting thing of like, you would think, you know, or I, mean, I don't know, not that you would think, yeah. but, I hate say, but it's just no, this weird deal. Yeah, I, I would imagine it's coming from some core belief, you know, like maybe, I mean, I don't know exactly what it could be, but like an underlying belief that like you're not worthy of friends. Maybe you had like a friend really hurt you in the past that you don't realize you're operating now from like scarcity, feeling like I don't want to open up to friends. It's just not worth it for me. 
and that could be, I just, I feel like I am open with, I don't know, who knows? And once again, I'm not turning this into Shane's counseling session. No, you know, no. I mean, you should be charging that. per hour for this. Oh, yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, should, I want to make right? sure you're making, yeah. yeah, I'm like, let me tell you about my mom started when I was yes. seven. But we're, I mean, yeah. We're going to be talking about your mom offline, Shane. We're we should. Bra- we breaking should. down what the heck went on, you know, like. She's the only listener. So that'll be good. Because then yeah. I feel like it's going to be really core. Cool. Then she'll be like, so what'd you guys talk right. about? <laughs> don't well, worry. Well, I mean, like it really is our parents. That's the blind spot. Like people don't realize that they even had abusive or neglectful parents. Because as a child, you would much rather take on the belief that you're just innately flawed and unlovable than you would ever admit that your parents don't love you and you're unsafe. I mean, children can't, they can't simultaneously believe that their parents don't love them and that they're unsafe and uh, feel safe and, you know, supported by their parents. So that's why we, we idealize our parents. A lot of times we, we diminish the very clear negative toxic qualities. I mean, how many people do you know that are still doing things for their mom, their dad, and all they do is bitch. All they do is bitch about them. Like, I gotta go pick up my mom. I gotta do it. It's like, stop doing things for them. You're idealizing, like you're still like as a little child being like, but my mom loves me, but this and that, like, no, she doesn't. Like you're an adult now, like get out of her. <laughs> she like, I, it's true though. It's true. You. A lot of, I know that, I know that it's a controversial statement. I know that it doesn't apply to anyone. So I want everyone listening to know I am speaking in generalities here, but straight up 90% of the people I talk to, when I really break it down, there is so much of their issues would be resolved if they just cut out their family. I mean, it is insane. The blind spot people have for their family. And I'm not yeah. talking about your wife and your kids. I'm talking about your, your own parents, your siblings. Your, where do you come from? Because a lot of people just carry that toxicity with them thinking they have some obligation to family stuff, none of that. Yeah. Let me tell you, when I cut out my family for the first time a few years ago, when I really started setting boundaries and distancing, man, that is when I took off. That's when I took off on LinkedIn. That's when I started making way more money. That's when I started facing my true authentic self. It would not have happened if I kept trying to gain the approval of my family. No way. So how does this, I'm, I'm going to try to tie this into the virus stuff, the marketing and the videos and stuff. Do you yeah. feel like the Shay that was doing those videos was Shay 1.0 and this is Shay 2.0? I mean, do you feel like there's a transition? Do you feel like there's going to be different content that's going to be coming out now that you've kind of broken out of that shell? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for asking me that. Well, I will always do the marketing content. You know, like I said, I am still very passionate about my digital marketing background and, and how I can bring this um, knowledge to business owners, specifically the older generation. A lot of the times the older generation is big on LinkedIn. A lot of them feel overwhelmed with social media. I feel very fortunate and privileged to be, um, it's an honor. Like I love teaching the older generation about social and I'll always do that. Or at least my company will do that in some facet or another when I move away and take more of a, a backseat role. But, you know, I am starting a podcast and that's going to be very much focused around mental health and the epidemic of narcissism. I have really big plans for that. It's going to be a lot more raw and unfiltered. So like if you follow me on LinkedIn, you like my mental health stuff, my vulnerability, you'll definitely want to subscribe to my podcast because it is going even deeper and starting to really teach people. It's going to be a lot about business too, like how narcissism thrives in the business world. That's a topic I'm very passionate about. So ultimately going to be like uh, interviewing different people in the mental health space who are part of this movement of dismantling this mental disorder that we've had in society for so long, but also interviewing business owners and breaking down how they see narcissism, either their own narcissism playing a role in their success or how they see it un- unfold in the business world as to why we have so much, um, yeah, so much conflict. You know, there's, there's definitely a huge lack of empathy happening at the corporate level, at the government level. It's narcissism. That's, that's what it is. <laughs> I love it. You got good energy. I like, I mean, really, like I said, I thought we were going to be talking about viral videos and all this kind of of superficial stuff. I know. I know. It's like, I've talked about it so much. Like I was telling Shane earlier, I've done so many podcasts this year. A lot of people want to ask me about marketing, my background, going viral, all that. It's fine. You know, I like talking about it. I've I've just talked about it. No, but you, it's it's just been talking about too much. I mean, this is, but this is once again, this is why we call it Shane Barker's Marketing Madness Podcast, because sometimes we'll talk about marketing 99% of the time. Sometimes it's one percent. So today is going to be closer to the one percent, which oh, is yeah. okay. We're, we'll talk about the other stuff. So, what is it? Have you figured out what the name of your podcast? Yep, it's called Narcissizzling. Narcissizzling. Yeah. Is that yeah. going to be a, a new word in the Webster dictionary? Is that narcissizzling? I plan. I intend to. Yeah. I mean, it's very like themed around like 
you know, I use narcissizzling as like a verb for like our uh, society. Like we are like on fire with narcissism. We don't even realize that it's so common. It's just accepted. But you know, it's like the theme is like fire. I got like an American flag as the background in the in the cover photo. I mean, it's it's a lot about. I mean, narcissism touches the whole planet, but it's a lot about what's happening here in the U.S. in Western culture and how that is really starting to seep into other cultures and this um. Yeah, this very like narcissistic attitude of like plowing people over, which I also believe stems from white people, which I'll get into on my show as well, um, is seeping into other cultures now. And, and people are starting to kind of either fall victim to it and like, you know, you can't beat them, join them, or they're becoming very conscious thought leaders. You know, like Gary Vaynerchuk, for example, I find is a great example. Some might actually consider him narcissistic, but truly he has a lot of empathy for such a digital mogul. I mean, he's like constantly calling out the toxic um, hierarchy in a lot of corporations, in a lot of agencies. I can tell that he really genuinely cares about his employees, giving them a, a comfortable life, giving them what they need and just having empathy. You know, that's, that's the modern age entrepreneur I want to support are the business owners who have an emotional intelligence. Yeah. So there we go. Man, I'll tell you. I mean, like I said, it's just, you just, you never know. And Shay, you just came in full force today. We got Shay 2.0 because Shay 1.0 was the old podcast. This is the oh new gosh, podcast. Right. We're going to make, at- make healing viral, you guys. We're going to make healing viral. <laughs> That's it. You come out with guns a blazing. Well, I yes. love it. So we, let's, we'll talk a little bit about market. We're going to turn that 1% into like 4% or something, right? Let's We're not, nothing, nothing too crazy. Hey, nothing, hey, nothing makes you a better marketer or business person or person really than, than working on yourself so this all applies <laughs> no it really does and it's also storytelling right i think it also goes True, into that yeah. as well like your your background and things i mean oh yeah i definitely want people to know where i come from because i feel a lot of people have a tendency to look at me like i have it all together i've been like the, on this it's like dude this has been a long journey for me and i also want people to understand that being insecure very much was a driver for my success in my 20s yeah. Well, and it's, I mean, you're still, what are you, 26? I mean, you're still, you're, you're I, I just turned 20, uh, 27 now. Yeah. 27. Look at you growing yeah. up right in front of us in the podcast. Look at that. Huh? This is me 2.0. Wait yeah. for 3.0 coming out here another year or two. Who knew? So what do you, I'm going to ask you this. I, I'm, I'm not going to screw marketing. We're going to talk about this continue. When you talk about healing and that kind of stuff, what are you continuously doing to improve yourself? Like, what are you doing on, on that side of things? I mean, the marketing side, I get it, the videos. And like I said, I know we were going to touch on that, but I lied again. What are you doing to like continuously heal and, and, and improve yourself? Like, what are you, what are, what, are you, what are you doing right now currently? Yeah, that's a great question. I do a lot of work. I do a lot of work. I have four different life coaches currently. <laughs> for many different things. I go to breath work, which is like huge. I know I talk about like plant medicines and how beneficial that can be to really catapult you to another level of consciousness. It's like a cheat code, plant medicines for healing. If you're intimidated by doing that sort of work and taking that route with like a shaman, breath work, I mean... Pfft. I've been to some insane breath classes in Miami where it's like, you literally feel like you're tripping. Like you go just as deep conscious wise. It's a, it's a clearing. It's super, super healing yoga. You know, I do meditate. I read a lot. I read a lot of books about, you know, childhood development, how I got this programming, how I can undo it. I'm still in the process of undoing it and recoding myself. And then, uh, yeah, just journaling. I love to journal. You know me, I'm a huge writer. So I write a lot. I write some poems sometimes. I'm just super artistic. I like to share my gifts. And then it never hurts to have, you know, close friends, good community to talk to as well. Yeah, for sure. I have a question about the life coach. Cause I'll, I'll be honest with you. Every time I hear life coach that I not to put all life coaches in one category. Right. But I instantly think like a life coach, like what do I have? Like I get it. You're going to tell me like life and what things you've been through. And I think there's some value there. I just have always been skeptical, right? And, and I, maybe I think, I think this is the thing. Is I look at the person that, that has a degree, and I'm not saying that's the person that knows how to do marketing. I'd rather go with a marketer that's actually grinded out and done it, right? So I do understand like the, but like explain to me like a life coach. Because I, I innocently, when I see somebody's a life coach, I assume that they just didn't make it some other place in life. And now they're just a life yeah. coach. Like, screw it. I can just talk about my life and maybe somebody will hire me. No, no, it's, I'm the opposite, man. I'm the opposite. I look at degrees and people who are self-taught and I, I've always had better experience with the people who are self-taught. This goes for for my, this goes for my own staff. You know, when I hired video editors, if they were a film grad or they were self-taught, self-taught person crushed it. Media buying, the self-taught person crushed it. Therapy, the self-taught person crushed it. If I'm going into surgery or I need a lawyer you better have a degree, baby. Like I'm not, I'm not messing around, but people don't realize that there's so many degrees that are actually counterproductive for finding a successful and effective, yeah, whatever you're looking for. Like I said, for me, for me, it's therapists. Like I, I really don't mess with psychologists. A lot of them just get paid to write scripts anyways. Like it's not, it's not true healing. A lot of them don't 
deep down have their own story of healing. They're just kind of part of the system. Life coaches are usually like ex-therapists. You know, I saw a naturopath once who was an MD. She left the practice because she refused to prescribe such a high amount of opiates. And this was 10 years ago when we were still in the opiate boom. She refused to prescribe so much opiates, she got fired. And now look what's happening. They're telling them to stop prescribing opiates. Like this, these are the people I want to work with. People yeah. who have been in the system, seen this shit and been like, dude, this is not right. Like I am not actually healing people. And whew, a lot of doctors get offended when I when you want to say it. Like I get that people go to med school wanting like their their intentions are probably great but a lot of people like have trouble facing if like being objective and asking like is this really helping people anymore or is this a very outdated practice that's really just intended to make money it's not intended to heal people yeah, at all because it's so a for, business yeah, yeah so for me the life coaches have, have actually been way better because i find that they're always someone who has actually done the work like actually faced their own traumas and the other thing about therapists is they can't talk about themselves. Not only do I feel a lot of clinically trained therapists don't have their own like experience, they didn't actually heal their own childhood wounds. They're just more in like a robotic state of like, oh, and how do you feel about that? And you know, here's some antidepressants. Life coaches can talk. Life coaches can share their own experience with you, which I personally find way more valuable because I'm a talker. So if I have a life coach and I share, <laughs> yeah. So if I have a life coach and I share my stuff and they're able to say, the same thing happened to me in my 20s or even even like I was also abused. You know, those things are very important to me. And I wasn't realizing before, oh my gosh, what a huge benefit that life coaches can get, you can get more personal with on, and a therapist will never talk about themselves. Yeah. No, that, that makes total sense. I, once again, I've always just thought life coaches and that's just me really being judgmental because I haven't had any life coaches, but I just always thought it's because it's just anybody, right. I can call myself a life coach and, you know, say, oh, hey. And you're like, right. And there's, and there's definitely bogus life coaches coaches out there like don't yeah. you know, don't don't take everything at like any value but i do want people to really start to face the reality because it is like a reality i mean data is proving it. it's just like the human consciousness our denial has not caught up because a lot of us are in debt and we don't want to admit that we went into debt for no reason <clears throat> college is bullshit I mean, college literally just limits people. It, it makes them more closed-minded. I believe college was originally intended to open people's minds, but because of all the resources that naturally occurred after college was invented, like the internet, you know, all of these social media platforms that connect people, groups online, consciousness, consciousness communities online, YouTube channels where you can literally learn all the trades of like video editing. You don't even need a degree. It's like surpassed college so much where now college is actually what's limiting. If you just go to college to get educated and you're not like utilizing the internet, the free resources, the mentorship, following Tony Robbins, following Grant Cardone, following Gary Vee, getting this, this relevant real time information. I mean, that's like where you need to be educating yourself. And a lot of people are still stuck thinking, well, my parents had a degree. Well, this is where you learn is college. I personally think it makes people more closed minded a lot of cases and then righteous after the fact, because it takes a very self-aware person who's willing to admit they were wrong to say, yeah, I went and I got a degree for no reason. I'm, I'm a waitress now. You know, you'll, you'll find a lot of people waitressing, making excuses. Like, I don't regret college though. I, you know, I, I met all my friends there and I did this. Like, it's bullshit. It's bullshit. You don't need to go to college to make friends. You don't need to be in a dorm to build that community and then start to become an adult. That's just outdated. Like, look at the today. Look at the modern day resources. I started a million dollar company with two college dropouts. They were both self-taught. I mean, it's really silly. And, and again, disclaimer, there's certain degrees you absolutely still need college for. I understand that. But it's very silly the amount of people that are going into debt for a liberal arts degree and they just end up working in a restaurant. Not to mention, they do it at age 18 when they don't even know what they want. Wait till you're 25 to go into debt for college. Really, really know what is this debt? What is this going to mean? How am I going to pay it off? What is my plan? Don't just blindly listen to your parents because they're still operating from the 70s when college was affordable and actually beneficial for a lot of people. And this, is, this ties into the narcissistic parenting. Parents not seeing the reality of what's good for their kids today and just wanting their kids to have a degree because all of their friends' kids have degrees and they want to fit in. Yeah. All right. So I have a few questions for you. So first yeah. of all, do you drink coffee in the morning? You probably jump right out I, of bed. You're in fifth, sixth gear. Yeah. I love coffee, but I'm like really naturally high energy. So I don't do well with a lot of uppers. I drink decaf coffee, but yeah, I love coffee. Okay. So I could tell you're always in fifth and sixth gear. How much do you sleep at night? Let's, let's go there. Let's talk about less than ever lately. I used to sleep a lot more. I used to have depression. I used to not want to get out of bed. I would sleep nine, even 10 hours a night if I could. These days I sleep about six or seven. Okay. So it's still, I mean, it's still healthy where right? you're in the healthy I sleep range. In on the weekends, on the weekends, I'll sleep like 
eight or nine, you know? Okay. Yeah, I wake up with a lot more excitement now. I don't need as much sleep. Well, you have more drive. I'm more excited about my new purpose. Especially the new purpose. I think that's exciting. Well, Yay. and it's really contagious, right? I'm at, what I mean by is that your energy is like, and I'm the same way, except I was quiet during this podcast. Usually, like when I, after I get off a podcast, people interview me, they go, God, you're very passionate. You're just talking. Yeah. It's like almost aggressive. And people are like, oh, you know, and I didn't, I don't do this as much because you, obviously you have the microphone and we want to see Shade 2.0 and be excited <laughs> about this raw Yay. shade that's going to be coming out and taking over the internet and, and curing people. So that's, that's once again, not a bad goal by any means. Um, so if, I am going to probably ask for some help from you is that the original title of this was going to be uh she Robottom secret formula for creating viral videos. I don't know if that's wow, going to be applicable. That's so funny. And we put disclosed, right? So this is going to be the big, oh my, like all the other podcasts, this is going to be totally different, um, which yeah. you're going to talk about. So we're, we'll have to figure out a different title. This one's going to be a little bit like, you know, tying in how to face your childhood wounds to become a better leader. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's what I want to do. You know, like I said earlier, I just really see so directly how not dealing with those insecurities of mine. I let people down. I let my employees down. I let my clients down. I don't want to do that anymore. I want to heal. It's awesome. Well, you got a, you got a goal, sister, and you're going after it. I love that. I, like I said, you Thank got a you. good little vibe, and I think this was, once again, not tons of marketing side of things, but I think it was definitely helpful in just being human, right, and, and the things that we deal with. I will end with just this, one marketing tip, okay? Me being so vulnerable and raw and willing to admit my flaws and my shortcomings is absolutely a uh, part of why I've grown so quickly on LinkedIn and garnered so much attention online. Vulnerability is a strength, even in business. I got to tell content creators this because a lot of them stay dry. They stay stuffy to niche about their market. That's fine. You know, obviously flex your skills in your industry, make content around that. But people do business with humans and I do not believe I would have had nearly uh, the success I have today with with my own business, my revenue, my LinkedIn following, had I not been honest and real with myself and my followers. So please, I know it's hard, it can be scary, but do the same for yourself because people will respect you for it and you're now becoming a positive force and a leader for other people to start doing the same. Keep it real, folks. Keep it real. Don't be, just grow. Be vulnerable. It's okay. You're in a safe place. It's okay. We're going to die. Okay. You know what I'm saying? We're going to die. You're going to die. Let's die with, let's figure it out. You'd be a great out. counselor. <laughs> just imagine a session. You're like, just so you know, you're going to die. <laughs> I it's just, so you're not going to make it. I know. Yeah, it's, it's That's how it happens. Well, so if anybody wants to get in contact with you, what's, uh, what's some good websites, all the LinkedIn, Instagram, give me some, give me some good yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, definitely follow me on LinkedIn. That's where all of my original content goes out first. Like I said, guys, I do, I know we didn't cover a ton on this uh, podcast, but I do go over a lot of uh, just general digital marketing tips, video editing tips for social, for the newsfeed on my LinkedIn. I'm always giving out free value. So definitely follow me there. It's a uh, LinkedIn.com slash in slash Shea Robottom. And of course, there's uh, definitely sprinklets of other content in there, just me talking about uh, life and personal development. And then um, to get in contact with me, if you want to learn more about my uh, B2B services on LinkedIn and how I help business owners attract their target market and increase revenue through this platform, you can definitely check out my website, all the infos there. So that's SheaRobottom.com. And there's a form there to fill out to set up a call. Awesome. Well, Shay, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Um, this was awesome. Once again, a little off to the right or left, but it depends on who we talked right. to, but it, it, it was an awesome interview. Hey, if I got you to make one friend after this, Shane, I did my job. So That's you're going to go get I'm, some. I'm going to be checking in on you, buddy. You got to make it. some friends. Yeah. You, you guys email me. I'm looking for friends. So just go ahead and put Shane. I'll be your friend. Send a picture. Yes. Uh, make sure you send your MySpace profile. I want something from a long time ago. And then we can kind of get to know each other a little bit through through maybe an interview or something like that. And once again, I'll recruit a friend it. and I'm going to bring one in. 2020, I'm going to find at least one friend for you, Shay. Oh, man. I, I've You're got welcome. so much. <laughs> Thank you. I got yeah. so much love, man. People, uh, I have so much support coming out of the woodwork. I'm very fortunate, not only for the, like, the close friendships that I have in person here in South Florida, but just the community online. I mean, it's, it's truly amazing. I'm, I love each and every one of you, anyone who's listening, who's been following me. If you've ever liked, shared, engaged with, or, you know, commented on a post, thank you because it does not go unnoticed. And every day I, I'm so grateful for every single one of my supporters. That's awesome. Very heartfelt. Well, Shay, thank you so much. And you guys, if you're listening to this podcast and you like what you hear, make sure you guys subscribe to it. 
And uh, please leave some comments, uh, nothing but good comments. If you want to leave bad comments, then you can go to YouTube or something like that. But all good comments are welcome on my podcast and any other place that can be publicly seen that I care about. Awesome, Shay. Have a great weekend, honey. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. I'm sure we'll keep in touch. Thank you, Shane. It was an honor. And you take care too, my friend. Mm-hmm.